From Hollywood, the CBS Radio Workshop. Scat! The world's divided into two kinds of people. Alurophobes and alurophiles. Cat haters and cat lovers. There's no in-between. The man is yet to be born who can take cats or leave them alone. Either you love them or you hate them. I hate them. And even if you're a sweet old lady who lives all alone with 13 pussies, I'm sure you won't think too ill of me when you hear what the king of the cats did to me. Scat, you black fiend! The CBS Radio Workshop, dedicated to man's imagination, the theater of the mind, presents The King of the Cats by Stephen Vincent Bonet, Adapted for radio and directed and produced in Hollywood by William N. Robeson. If I hadn't been so young, I suppose I could have taken it in stride. Of course, I didn't think I was young. I was two years out of Yale, and I thought I knew all the answers. Certainly, I knew I was in love. They say the most beautiful women in the world are Eurasian, and they're right. Vivranca's skin was like golden velvet, her long straight hair, ebony in the moonlight, and her eyes, blue as a field of larkspur, fathomless as the center of heaven. Her mother had been an American missionary, her father Siamese, and undoubtedly a prince, my Aunt Emily insisted. Ordinarily, Aunt Emily wouldn't have approved of Ivranka, but this was the year that the king and I was a sellout at the St. James Theater, so a hostess who could decorate her dinner table with a breathlessly beautiful Siamese princess was definitely a hostess with a mostess. At least Aunt Emily always addressed her as princess, and Vivranka always replied to the My title. My dear, dear princess, how sweet of you to drop in. And tell me how nice you could get away from the office early. Lemon or cream, princess? Neither, Mrs. Calvern. And no sugar. Oh, of course, my dear. How stupid of me to forget. Here you are. Thank you. Tommy? I'll get myself a highball, if you don't mind. No, dear, go right ahead. I believe you know everyone, Princess, Mrs. Dandridge. Yes, Mrs. Yes. Stanford, Professor uh, Fairweather. Yes, indeed. <laughs> uh, Mrs. Dandridge has been telling us about the most fascinating man, my dear, a symphony conductor with a tail. A tail? How interesting. I still can't believe it. I saw it myself, twice. First in Paris and then again at the Teatro Royale in Rome. He conducted the Beethoven Pastoral, and, my dear, you've never heard such effects from an orchestra. You see, he conducted with it. With his tail? Oh, no. Oh, yes. And such a charming person. So urbane, so utterly fascinating. I should imagine I would love to meet him. And you shall, my dear. I'll see to it when he arrives. Oh, he's coming over? Yes. Yes, the new symphony people have invited him to be guest conductor for three concerts. He'll be very busy, of course, but he's promised to give me what time he can spare. Oh, that's sweet of you, dear, but you mustn't wear yourself out. The rest of us must do our part, too. I'll be only too glad to help entertain him. Oh, now, that won't be necessary. I'm just going to give Monsieur Thibault... Sweet name, isn't it? Felix Thibault. I'm just going to show him the simplest of times. A little reception for a hundred or so after his first concert. Perhaps he he hates large mixed parties on account of his little idiosyncrasy. It makes him feel a trifle shy of strangers. I should think it would, to say nothing of his friends and acquaintances. Uh, Vivranca, my dear, how would you like to go out nightclubbing with a jerk with a tail? It might be interesting. He is not a jerk, Tommy. He is one of the finest conductors in Europe. Sounds to me like he's the smartest showman since P.T. Barnum. What do you think, Professor? Uh, Well, I should be interested to see this Monsieur Thibault myself. In the Middle Ages, there was a widespread belief in homo codatus, or men with tails, but I know of no authenticated case. Of course, we all have tails, in a manner of speaking. What? Oh, vestigial, of course. But the last few vertebrae of anyone's spine, the coccyx, is the evidence of a concealed and rudimentary tail. 
I dare say it might be possible in an extraordinary case that a throwback, a reversion to type... How fascinating! I never realised that I... Well, I think it'd be fun to get together a box for the first concert, all of us. Oh, well, I'm afraid I shall have my own box party. But, of course, you'll come on to the reception later at my place. Why, thank you, my dear. Then there'll be the Professor and the Princess and Tommy. Uh, count us out, Aunt Emily. When Vivranca and I want to see freaks, we'll go to the circus. I shall be very pleased to attend the concert, Mrs. Culverin. <laughs> ah, splendid, my dear. But Vivranca... Is there anyone you'd like me to ask to replace Tommy? But Aunt it Emily... It doesn't make any difference. I'm only interested in meeting this wonderful Monsieur Félix Thibault. But Vivranca... I went to the concert... What else could I do? We took our seats in the box as the orchestra took theirs on stage and began their aimless squeakings and tootings, those caterwaulings which, I must confess, make about as much sense to me as the music that follows. Aunt Emily was in a dither of fluttery expectation. Professor Fairweather had lost much of his scientific detachment, and Vivranca, gorgeous Vivranca, sat beside me silent, but so tense I could almost feel her breathless expectation. And I didn't like it at all. And then Monsieur Thibault walked on stage. A lithe, dark-haired man with piercing eyes like a black panther, his head weaving the way the big cats do when they're behind bars. It was true. They hadn't lied. From beneath the tails of his dress coat curled a third, a living tail, which he carried nonchalantly draped over his wrist. He acknowledged the presence of the audience with a regal bow. And then that incredible tail twined with dainty carelessness around a black baton on the podium. While he remained facing the audience, the tail rapped three times upon the podium for the orchestra's attention and then raised for the downbeat. At this horrible moment, I glanced at Vivranca. Her whole body was rigid as steel, and the blue flowers of her eyes were bent upon Monsieur Thibault in terrible concentration. She took my hand in hers, and her long red fingernails felt like a claw as the hideous tail of that monster on stage lashed into the downbeat of Night on Bald Mountain. Never before had the new symphony orchestra played so superbly, and certainly never had it been led with such a genius. Freak, showman, poseur, whatever else Monsieur Thibault might have been, he was certainly a great conductor. No man's hands and arms, no matter how dexterous or eloquent, ever equaled the delicate elan and powerful grace of Monsieur Thibault's tail. A sable staff, it dominated the brasses like a flicker of black lightning. An ebon and usive wit, it drew the last exquisite breath of melody from the woodwinds and ruled the stormy springs like a magician's wand. That's the way it went through the Bach Passacaglia, through the afternoon of a fawn, through the Beethoven Ninth. New York music lovers had never heard anything like it before. And New York music lovers never behaved quite like this before. As Monsieur Thibault finally glided from the stage after his 15th bow, the president of the Wednesday Sonata Club had to be forcibly restrained by her husband from flinging her $90,000 string of pearls after the maestro in an excess of aesthetic appreciation. And as we shouldered our way through the hysterical mob toward the waiting limousines, I distinctly heard Ludwig Willems, conductor of the mid-century Philharmonic, say to Dr. Friedrich Laskar, the great plastic surgeon... But it must be possible, Doctor. Think of the miracles they have accomplished in Denmark. There's $10,000 in it for you, Doctor, if only you can find a way to graft the tail onto me. But through all the hysteria... Vivranca remained silent, self-possessed, her azure eyes fathomless as the center of heaven. 
She was silent as we drove to Mrs. Dandridge's party in Aunt Emily's limousine. But this was not too remarkable because Aunt Emily never stopped raving about Monsieur Thibault. But aside from the heavenly music, my dears, the man himself, such elegance, such poise, such... Mm, I tell you, Tommy, if your Uncle Henry weren't still around and I was a few years younger, well, tail and all. Our hostess, Mrs. Dandridge, looked like the cat who had swallowed the canary, having trapped the social lion of the season, if I may be permitted to scramble a metaphor. Let Aunt Emily have her Siamese princess. Dolly Dandridge had the world's greatest conductor, complete with tail. And this dear Monsieur Thibault is my dearest friend. Emily, may I present Monsieur Thibault? Monsieur Thibault, Mrs. Henry Culverine. Enchanté, Madame Culverine. Oh, Monsieur Thibault! It is an honor to meet you. I am overcome. Yes, yes. Thank you much, oh, madame. I feel I should be on bended knee. It is not necessary. Oh, I should kiss your hand. You, you are too kind, no? Oh, I must. No, no, please, madame. He stopped trying to stop Aunt Emily from making a fool of herself. He had seen Vivranca. The end of his tail, just the very end, twitched turgidly and he seemed to be at her side in a bound rather than a step. It was foolish and superfluous for Mrs. Dandridge to do the honors. Princess, may I present Monsieur Thibault? Monsieur, Princess Vivranca. Maestro. Princess. They exchanged no more words. Monsieur Thibault presented his arm to the princess. She linked hers and his, and his infernal tail switched from his right arm to his left to come to rest across Vivranca's wrist. Thus, like royalty, they made their way across the room, the guests parting to make a path for their regal progress. Now, Tommy, you mustn't take it so hard. After all, the princess is an awfully sweet child, but she isn't exactly our kind. And I suppose she's his. She seems to be. Look at them. So darlingly foreign, both of them. Yeah, aren't they? Out of this world. And they were. I didn't realize it until I'd said it. They were somehow out of this world. They didn't walk across the room. They glided. The tail-coated maestro with his third tail so insidiously ubiquitous and the princess's hips swaying in the golden-threaded silken sheath of her skirt. A bas-relief from Angkor Vat suddenly breathing life. She never left his side for the rest of the evening. I didn't like it. I didn't like it a bit. But there was nothing I could do about it. After all, one can't very well make a scene, especially with a guest of honor. But Professor Fairweather, detached man of science, was bound by no such restrictive codes. Extraordinary. Simply extraordinary. I think it stinks. What? How's that, Tommy? What stinks? The way Vivranca's acting. Oh, oh, nothing extraordinary about that. Her behavior's quite normal, I should say. Oh, it's the tail that's extraordinary. Yeah. Where'd he be without it? Where indeed, and what? Just another foreigner with a kiss-your-hand, madame, accent. They're a dime a dozen. Yes, the tailless ones. Uh-oh, the princess has joined the other ladies for a moment. It's my opportunity. For what? A word with Monsieur Thibault. I'd like several words with oh, him. Uh, Monsieur Thibault, Monsieur Thibault. Uh, ah, uh, Professor Fairweather. Yes, yes, yes. Uh, may I speak to you a moment? But of course. You know Tommy Calvin, I believe? I don't think I've had the pleasure. You are the lovely Mrs. Calvarine's son? No, her nephew. How interesting. And Princess Vivranca's friend. We're practically engaged. Congratulations. I thought you ought to know. Indeed, yes. I am honored by your confidence. Now, Professor... Uh, uh, yes, Monsieur Thibault, I speak to you as a man of science. Yes? A true specimen of Homo caudatus has been unknown to modern science until now. Homo caudatus? Yes, a man with a tail. What? Come now, Professor, it's nothing to be sensitive about. My interest is purely impersonal. Your interest? Yes, purely scientific. It wouldn't take much of your time, a morning or an afternoon, perhaps no more. What would not take much time? Uh, an examination and measurements, x-rays and An so examination? On. Measurements of what? Your tail. 
Dunmer for the Brocco gun, me on. Monsieur Thibault, I did not. Monsieur Thibault's tail lashed stingingly across the professor's face, cutting off his last words. Then the conductor turned and stalked out of the room, growling and spitting in his anger. Without even bothering to retrieve his hat and coat, he kept right on through the foyer and on out into the chilly night. Oh, dear. <laughs> Wonderful, Professor. Wonderful. I can't thank you enough. Oh, for what, Tommy? For getting rid of him. But I wasn't trying to get rid of him. I know, but you did. And that's all that counts. Only he didn't. Aunt Emily realized at once that Mrs. Dandridge had lost her catch. For certainly Monsieur Thibault would never again enter the house where he had been insulted. And Aunt Emily moved with the speed of an aggressor nation. Within three days, Monsieur Thibault had accepted her invitation to be a house guest and had moved in bag and baggage. Now there was no escaping my tailed nemesis. And now it took no urging upon Vivranca to visit Aunt Emily. She wanted to be there. She preferred being there to any entertainment I could offer her. But there was one ray of hope. Thibault was committed to a long concert tour all the way to the coast, and with him out of the way, I felt sure I could mend the fences he had torn down. The day before the farewell dinner Aunt Emily was giving him, I dropped by after work to find my aunt in more than her usual dither. Oh, Tommy, isn't it just too, too exciting? I don't know, Aunt Emily, until I find out what it is. Why, Monsieur Thibault and the princess, of course. What about them? They're in love. This scarcely strikes me as news. And they're going to be married. Oh, no. Oh, yes, I'm going to make the announcement at the dinner party tomorrow night. Aunt Emily, how can you do this to me? Well, I didn't do it to you. Uh, anyway, you must face this like a man. You know, you must find some nice homey girl like that Gretchen Woolwine from Chicago. You used to like her. I was younger than Aunt Emily. And that was before I knew Vivranca. Well, my dear, I'm afraid you've lost your princess. C'est la vie, c'est l'amour, as I always say. Where is Vivranca? Is she here? Oh, my, yes, she's in the library with Monsieur Thibault. Naturally. Now, don't disturb them, dear. I'm sure they want to be alone. Naturally. The hard knot in the pit of my stomach grew and grew. Finally, when Aunt Emily chattered off to change for dinner, I slipped down the hall toward the library. I couldn't hear voices, and the room was dark. I was about to flick on the light switch when I heard a strange sound. And then I saw them silhouetted in the dying light of the fire. Thibault was seated in a chair, and Vivranca crouched on a stool at his side, while his hand softly, smoothly stroked her dark hair. And all I could think of was black cat and Siamese kitten. And then I realized what the sound was. They weren't talking to each other. No, they were purring to each other. But, Professor Fairweather, what am I going to do? Now, Tommy, you must get hold of yourself. This whole thing has disturbed you to the point of hallucination. Nonsense, Professor. I heard them. I tell you, I heard them purring. Fantasy, sheer sure, fantasy. Just because the man does have a tail, you're imagining... I'm positive he's a cat. And you cannot stand the thought of uh, Vivanka marrying... I can't stand the thought of her marrying anyone. But a cat? It's monstrous. What am I going to do, Professor? Well, you might have the SPCA pick him up. Oh, please, Professor. Oh, oh I'm sorry, Tommy. I know you're serious. Wait a minute. I just thought of something. Oh, no, it's too ridiculous. Ah, tell me, what? Oh, Tommy, you're a bad influence. You're leading my reason from the narrow path of scientific method to the doubtful fields of the supernatural. What are you talking about? <laughs> Well, I was thinking of a story I read once. Oh, it's turned up in one form or another in the folklore of every land on earth, I suppose. It has to do with a traveller who saw within a ruined abbey a procession of cats lowering into a grave a little coffin with a tiny crown on it. Oh, filled with horror, the traveller hastened away from the place, and when he reached his destination, he, he couldn't help telling his host of the strange ritual he'd seen. Well, scarcely had he finished when the host's cat, who'd been lying in front of the fire, leapt to its feet and cried out, Then I am king of the cats, and disappeared in a flash up the chimney. So? Well, proceeding upon your premise that uh, Monsieur Thibault is a cat, you will grant that he's a very extraordinary cat, a cat who could uh, presumably one day be king of the cats? Of course. 
Of course. Yes, it might work. I'll pull it on him tomorrow night at Aunt Emily's dinner party. Only... Uh, only what? Well, he won't buy that ruined abbey part. Well, then use your imagination. Uh, make it Central Park. Sure. Sure, why not? Bring the story up to date. A funny thing happened today on my way up from the office. Aunt Emily outdid herself. Her dinner table was a poem of spring flowers, gold plate, the purest white linen, the candles fluttering ever so little in the warm night breeze that came through the open French doors. Time and again through the first three courses, I tried to get into the stream of conversation, but when Aunt Emily's on, this is practically impossible. Thibault and Vivranca, seated on either side of her, were oblivious of everything. They ate little and never took their eyes off each other. Finally, the plates were being taken away, and I knew Aunt Emily was going to make her announcement during the dessert course. I just had to get my two cents worth in first. <laughs> never forget that summer. <laughs> Eden Rock was never gayer. And after the Duke and the Duchess arrived, well... Uh, a, a funny thing happened on my way up from the office this Johnny, evening. I was about to tell... A funny thing happened on my way up from the office this evening. I was taking a shortcut across Central Park when I came upon the darndest thing. In a little clump of bushes, I saw a procession of cats. Oh, six or eight of them. And they were carrying a little coffin toward a tiny open grave. And on the coffin was an exquisite little golden crown. Now, isn't that the strangest thing? Silence. The guests looked at me as though I were quite mad. That is, all except Thibault and Vivranca. Thibault looked at me, the end of his tail flicking above the edge of the table, and Vivranca looked at Thibault, the way she had that night at the concert, tense, breathless, her eyes blue flame. At last, Aunt Emily spoke. Well, Tommy, are you quite finished? Uh, yes, Aunt Emily, that's, that's all I had to say. I should hope so. Well, that summer, when the Duke and Duchess... Excuse me, out... Mrs. Calverine. Oh, of course, maestro. Tommy, you are quite positive of what you saw this evening? Oh, yes. Yes, you don't go around making up things like that. No, of course not. Yet one must be sure of the details. Now, there was a crown on the coffin, you say? That's right. A golden crown? Yes. With tiny pearls on it? That's right. You're absolutely sure? Absolutely. Then I am king of the cats! He leapt to his feet from his chair to the table and in one bound disappeared through the open French window. And an instant later, Vivanka followed. As she disappeared from the balcony to the alley below, I caught just a glimpse of something protruding beneath her silken sheath skirt. It was a black-tipped, golden tail. And that's why I have become an ailerophobe. A cat hater. So is my wife, Gretchen. Uh, we were married shortly afterwards. But then Gretchen never did like cats in the first place. Especially Siamese cats. From Hollywood, the CBS Radio Workshop has presented The King of the Cats by Stephen Vincent Benet, with Byron Kane as Tommy. Music arranged and conducted by Amerigo Marino. Included in the cast were Jeanette Nolan, Helen Cleave, Peggy Weber, Joe Kearns, and Jay Novello. Next week, from New York, the workshop will present a psychological study of the do-it-yourself movement, The Day the Roof Fell In, by Charles S. Monroe. Suspense, radio's outstanding theater of thrills, follows over most of these stations with the chilling story of the man who stole the Bible. For a half hour of breathless terror, stay tuned to this frequency. You won't regret it. <laughs>